Hi everybody, my name is Savannah Stanley and I am hosting our series with Flynn Scientific called Science is Everywhere. Today I am joined by Alan. Alan, would you like to say hello to everybody and introduce uh, the thing you brought for us to discuss today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what I've brought along is this following image taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, okay. So that's the Cartwheel Galaxy, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so do you want to discuss today galactic collisions or the instrument array on the JWST? Well, while those are both very interesting topics, there's actually a lot of good resources out there already where people far more qualified than myself discuss them. What I actually wanted to talk about was um, the stars in the picture, or more specifically, the uh, diffraction spikes around the stars, you know, that kind of um, eight-pointed starburst pattern that we see. And what got me thinking about this was recently I was on a popular science website and they were talking about James Webb's um, James Webb Space Telescope takes image of you know most distant galaxy we've ever seen. I'm like, oh, cool, I want to see this image. So I click the link. There's the headline. And just beneath it, there's a photo. And I looked at the photo and I went, well, that's not a James Webb Space Telescope photo. Now, admittedly, I was hoping to see a picture I'd never seen before. But there was a thing about the stars that gave away that they were not James Webb pictures. And so I'll show you now the same photo taken by Hubble several years ago. Okay. So in this case, if you look at those same stars, you'll see that they have a four-pointed starburst around them. The diffraction spikes are different. Okay, so before we continue to discuss, though, the diffraction spike patterns of the JWST versus the Hubble, I think there are two important things that we do need to discuss first. So first, I just want to confirm my assumption that although these two images look completely different in color, you don't ever want to rely on that for determining which is which because they're all false color images, right? Yeah, absolutely. The wavelengths in these pictures are outside of the visible spectrum. We could not see them if we were looking through a super-powered optical telescope ourselves. Um, and in fact, you can even download the raw data from NASA and recreate these images as you see fitter. You might think that, oh, they've overdone the reds in this section or they've you know, not brought out enough blue. So that's something you can actually do yourself. And uh, what was the second question? Uh, so the second thing, I think we need to talk about where the diffraction spikes actually come from. Absolutely. The easiest analog to think about is um, water ripples moving across a surface. They, you know, you, they start, you throw in a pebble into some water and it starts spreading out. If there is an obstacle, as they go past it, it doesn't just like delete the ripple. The ripples then start to move around behind that obstacle and fill in the gap. As the ripples start to overlap, they can positively reinforce, which will give us a peak, or negatively reinforce, giving us a trough. A very similar thing happens with light. And where we have peaks, we'll have bright spots. And where we have troughs, we will have dark spots. So these diffraction spikes are coming about because something is obstructing the light and then as it comes around, it starts overlapping and we see the bright spots where it um, positively overlaps. So what do you think would be the easiest way to observe a diffraction spike at home? So there's two simple ways that you could observe a diffraction spike at home. The first is at night, look through a window that has a screen over it and just look at like a distant um, street light. Uh, let me show you an example. I've taken a picture of that exact thing. And the screens, well, at least in my house, you know, they are square in shape. And so we end up with a four pointed starburst around the light source. If your windows don't have screens, you could also use like a flower sieve because again, you have that kind of square shaped grid within. Or actually the 
simplest way to view a diffraction spike that doesn't involve any extra equipment is to simply go out there and squint at a light source. So like at night, if you squint at oncoming traffic, you'll see a burst because as you close your eyelids, you end up creating a very thin slit, which will be able to create diffraction spikes. Also, your eyelashes are a whole lot of little wee lines that get in the way of light, and they can also generate diffraction spikes. So we don't need a multi-million dollar telescope in space to see these things. In fact, for as long as we've had eyelids, we've been able to go out there, squint at a bright light source, and see diffraction spikes. Oh, well, that, that's really interesting. So I know that uh, you had recently tried to do some astrophotography. Yes, and I failed miserably, which is probably the best thing you can ever do when you start a new hobby is to go out and fail miserably. I'll show you the best photo I got from my entire um, camping trip. The problem is this photo you're about to see was taken with my cell phone, not with the camera that I actually took to do the astrophotography. And the reason why I like to, I think it's good to fail early is because you start to learn a lot of lessons and it's a humbling experience. I went out there and I was all concerned with ISO um, curves to see like what's my camera's uh, response to different ISO levels at night. Uh, what aperture size should I be using? How long can I do an exposure before I'll see star trails? What I completely really overlooked was how do you really focus in and make sure that you've got a nice sharp image? Because in my mind, well, that's easy. I know where infinity is on my camera. Stars are pretty close to infinity. It's going to be somewhere near them. So I, uh, I focused through the viewfinder. I never bothered to zoom in and just was like, yeah, those look like stars. Let's go. And I snapped picture after picture after picture of uh, fuzzy bright blobs with backgrounds that just look like noise. And yeah, not a single usable picture was taken by, you know, the actual camera. You know, and the best photo I got was just taken with my, my cell phone. So come home, start researching and going, okay, how do I make sure I focus well? And the answer came out to be, well, diffraction spikes. So I 3D printed this, which is a Batonoff mask. It has three different areas of lines. Each one set slightly differently. I'll, um, I'll send you a larger image so you're not having to squint at your screen. Although it's a great way to see diffraction spikes. It is. Um, and what these lines do is because there are three different orientations, we're going to see three different stripes. We'll end up with a six pointed star appearing on our images. So I've been testing this out with street lights. And the first picture I'm going to show you is slightly out of focus. And what you'll notice is that we've got a cross and a vertical line that's slightly above the cross. Okay. It doesn't go through the middle. Um, and in the background, there's actually a very, very out of focus car headlight going on the hill, um, which is just the random blob with a line. If you're completely out of focus, it's a blob. But when you get close, you start to see this line and things not quite right. Now I adjust the focus on my camera. And now in this picture, you see that that line goes straight through the middle of the cross, meaning that this picture is now correctly focused on that light source. Wow, so, you can definitely see a big difference there. Yeah, and it means that next time I go out and do some astrophotography, I'm gonna be taking that and I'm gonna be making sure that I am really well in focus before I even start worrying about, you know, what else do I wanna take a picture of? Because it doesn't matter what you point it at, if it's out of focus, it's not gonna be usable. So back to the Hubble and to the JWST. So when we're looking at the structures of those, how can we tell the difference in those, those uh, diffraction spikes? Okay, so as I just mentioned with that mask, there were three different lines which gave different 
spikes. The position and shape of those spikes was related to the lines. If you look at this picture of the Hubble, it's a cutaway, you can see the secondary mirror has a support structure where all of the arms are at 90 degrees to each other. This then generates a diffraction spike pattern where all of the points on the star are at 90 degrees to each other. Now if you look at this picture of the James Webb telescope, you'll notice that the big gold like mirror down the bottom is made up of a whole lot of hexagons. Each of those hexagons is going to generate a diffraction spike. And those are the big spikes that we see in the image. You'll notice that there's six really big spikes. There's also a support structure that comes up to hold the secondary mirror. And that support structure has three arms, which will generate another, um, another six diffraction spikes. However, four of those spikes overlap the bigger ones. And so what you'll notice is that there's a very small diffraction spike that's sitting you know, perpendicular to the big spike down the middle, which is due to one of those uh, support struts, the one that um, you know, kind of rotated out of alignment with the hexagons in the mirror. Wow, thank you so much for dis uh, discussing diffraction with us today. So clearly there is a lot more application that we can put with this kind of Oh, topic. absolutely. We could talk for hours on this topic. And we will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Alan. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming on today and thank you everybody for watching our series today. And don't forget to keep an eye out for more ways that science is everywhere.